welcome. I'm glad to have this opportunity to show you some of the ideas that I have put together with respect to the design and the stringing and the control of marionettes, particularly those marionettes that I have uh, brought out to show you today. I'm Jim Rose of the Antioch Puppet Theater, and I'll be showing you first a uh, more or less stylized body of a standard marionette, as I conceive of the standard. This marionette is one-third life-size, and at 24 inches in height represents a uh, fully adult human male. I have taken proportions for this figure from an anatomy chart, frankly, and have transposed them into the size of this figure. When I took the measurements, I measured from the center of the ankle joint to the center of the knee joint to the center of the leg joint at the hip to the waist uh, right at the belt line. And similarly, the length of the hand, uh, the length of the lower arm, upper arm, length of the neck, and so forth. This stylized head, of course, bears only a, a rough resemblance to human proportions. And if, you, and if we look at the side view here, of course, the figure has no real depth at all. It's only an inch and a half thick, something I could cut conveniently from two by sixes and broomstick handles and dowel sticks. I call this figure Rodney McDowell. The uh, joints in the marionette figure have all been uh, designed so that they will allow human movement or human-like movement and stop at the limits that would normally apply to a human being. For instance, the arm can be bent thus and cannot be bent backwards because there is here at the back of the elbow a set of two opposing faces in the joint which we call a stop, preventing it from going beyond the normal position. Similar limits apply in the wrist. And if you can see close in, you can see that there are faces or stops a kind of a, a flat cone at the end of the lower arm and then flat faces on the hand itself which come up against each other and prevent the hand from moving beyond a reasonable limit. You may have noticed already that I'm using a kind of cord, a sash cord. It's a very lightweight line. It's a woven cord lighter than uh, ordinary clothesline, sash cord. There's a single sash cord in the wrist and there are two in the elbow and in the knee and at the ankle and at the hip. The uh, neck of this marionette is uh, free to move at two positions, one at the base of the skull and one at the top of the torso. Many puppeteers will choose not to have the doubly articulated neck, but I prefer it thinking that it's more flexible and gives us a wider range of movement possibilities. The hip is an interesting uh, joint, and it's one which has been standard for a number of years among professional puppeteers. As you may notice, there is a latitude here to the sway of the upper torso against the hip, which is constricted by the colliding of the hip and the, and the torso, front and back, and to the sides. The, uh, the real joint is, o is only at this one point here in the center where the uh, sash cord attaches the two pieces point to ridge. And these two lines at the sides are really limiting lines. They, can be, they, 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 they pass loosely through the torso and are attached in a fixed position at the top of the hip. But they can swing, they slide through the upper torso. And then when the, when the hip or torso are swung opposite to each other, they provide a stop so that the body cannot be twisted too far and you don't have the torso facing the rear suddenly. The uh, leg joint, as I have already mentioned, is a double uh, cord. There are two pieces of, of sash cord there and you can see the stop here and the stop up against the, the face of the hip, the underside of the hip, and a stop at the rear. Those two faces stop against each other. The ankle, likewise, is a, is a two-line joint. 
And if you can see, uh, as I hold the, the, the feet together on my hand, notice that the feet are splayed apart, somewhere between 15 and 30 degrees. I like to have about 15 degrees on each turned out so that when the marionette walks forward, the toes do not collide and it doesn't get pigeon-toed and collapse against uh, the other foot. Now I'm going to put the marionette down and pick up the standard control, which I now use. I refer to it as the Pepito marionette control. And I have uh, arrived at the design of this, having modified several different controllers to my satisfaction. And I'd like to just go through identifying with you the parts of this controller so that you can tell if you should just, uh, wish to operate one yourself, you can do so easily. I've rested my left thumb in a cradle here which allows me to move the foot bar alternately left and right foot. Now I'm holding the controller with its front toward you. This is the left knee. Over here is the right knee. The nose of the puppet is suspended here. The right ear is suspended here. And the left ear, of course, on the opposite side. The shoulders of the marionette, which bear all of the weight of the body, are suspended at this point, which is about halfway back on the control. And at the very rear of the control, this little hole is the one through which the string to the rear of the back at the belt line is attached. There are rings here at the wingtip ends on the main control, and they are used to suspend the hand control. And I'm holding the hand control, one of them. This little airplane shape controls the right hand and it is suspended six inches below these two rings. There are a string at the front and a string at the rear of this little airplane. The front string passes through this eye and the rear string passes through the other eye. Now the two strings that rise from this hand control run continuously across the major control and down to a second hand control. So there are two of these commonly in use uh, on, my con on my puppets, my marionettes. Now I want to say something about three-point suspension, which was uh, very much popularized by Albrecht Roser, who has mentioned these at workshops and festivals all around the country and, and at his school in Stuttgart. The three-point control of a, of a marionette's hand and head, I will illustrate in a lar longer shot. This marionette has been strung already. And if you look at his hand, I'll tell you where the strings are attached. There's one at his pinky right here. There's one at his thumb. There's one at his wrist in this case, just at the very lower end of his lower arm. Notice that when I, I pick up his two, his pinky and thumb string, I raise the front end of his hand and lower it. I hold the wrist in one position and lower his pinky and thumb strings and he's waving. I can raise his thumb or his pinky or his wrist and then alternate so that we get a rather fluid rotating movement using all three of those points of suspension. Now, if you look at the marionette's head, I'll point out here's one string at the end of his nose, which, of course, I've made conveniently long, and his ears are individually suspended by strings at their extremities as well. These three strings, if you remember, are attached one at the front of the controller and the other two at near the ends of the second wing back. Now, I'm going to turn his head to the left by raising his left ear only. Now I'm raising his right ear so that he can turn to the right. And now I'll raise his nose only. And now I'll drop the front of the controller down. Notice that the puppet is bowing as well as turning his head down. If I wish to have him drop his head without bowing, I simply take my left hand on the controller and shorten the shoulder strings by pressing them up against the bottom of the controller, which allows his head to droop. Now with his head down, I can have him raise his nose, so he's kind of skulking forward with his, with his head. And by lifting and turning his head to one side, one ear at a time, 
he can be furtively looking around in the woods. The three-point control, then, is very useful in establishing a very subtle control over the head and the hands individually. I'd like to show you a stringing mechanism through the leg, which was invented by my father, Rufus Rose, some long years ago. Most puppeteers, I suppose, uh, at the beginning, make the assumption that they can simply raise the knee of the marionette as a, as a function of walking. Of course, the knee must be raised, but in most cases, the, if the ankle is jointed, the toe will tend to drag, so that if the marionette is stepping across a shag rug or across rough terrain, there's some likelihood that he may trip and stumble. Now, my father, Rufus, has designed uh, this mechanism, which allows the toe to be raised by the same string that raises the knee. In this case, the string, which goes to the end of the leg control, passes down through the thigh, out through the back of the leg, the upper leg, in through the rear of the calf, out through the front of the ankle, and down onto the top of the foot. Thus, if you raise the string, which is essentially attached to the front of the foot, the foot is raised, and the leg is raised with it. I'll illustrate that same action down on the floor. By alternately raising my left and right end of the foot control, he is allowed, to, he is made to walk. There's one more thing which I would like to mention in coaching a beginning puppeteer or reminding a, a, a journeyman puppeteer about walking a marionette, and that is that it isn't a matter simply of the feet being placed one in front of the other alternately. It's also a matter of the body jouncing up and down somewhat, because as we walk forward, we do in fact raise our heads and bodies above the ground rather more at the beginning of a step than we do at the end. Now, I'll I'm, I'm going to move the puppet a little bit, and you want to follow him to see the effect of his rising and falling with his foot movement. Now, that's a fairly gentle thing. I don't want to exaggerate it very much. I think it's well to have the marionette's feet apart when he comes to the end of a stride and have him turn back because it gives a nice, interesting body position. Notice also that even though I'm not holding on to his hand strings or, or, or his hand controls, that his hands do not rest straight down dead at his side. They're always somewhat animated by any movement in the controller. Now, I think it is well, on general principle, to have the marionette moving his hands as well as the rest of his body so that he's not walking around like an automaton. Now, I want to show you two more strings which I call specials. On the controller at this position, and I'll give you time to get in here close on this shot, uh, on the controller at this position I have attached one string which runs down through the marionette's head to his left hand, another string which runs down through the marionette's head to his right hand. And on this little sub-control, which I manipulate his right arm with, I have put a little nail, a little hook, and it is capable of picking up either of those two strings and plucking it out to the side. And in this case, I've plucked the, the, the uh, right hand up to, to the puppet's mouth, and of course, I haven't touched the string with my own fingers at all. Now I'll pluck his other string, his left special, and the, his left hand is drawn up to the point where the string disappears into his head at the mouth position. I can pluck them both, and I put one tight and one loose, so his one hand goes up to his mouth, and the other approaches it only somewhat. Specials can be run to any part of the body and accommodate very many kinds of movement. They don't all have to be hand to mouth although sometimes puppeteers get the idea that's the only way to go, hand to mouth. I'm going to retire him. And I want to say something about characterization. We've looked now so far at a generalized, stylized, simplified marionette, as I would describe him, without character inherent, except as he may move and create character. 
course, movement is a great basis for the creation of character in an actor, a dancer, or any form of, of puppet. Uh, I believe that uh, it is wise for a puppeteer to understand that as he creates a character, that movement must always be the transcendent value on which you depend to transmit that character. It may be wise and useful to choose, as I have in, in this character, a strong color scheme. You may choose in another character a rather laid back or subtle and soft color scheme. But in both cases, it is essential, I think, for the movement to be the chief architect of the character. Now, I'm going to put Lady Macbeth. I haven't yet really named her. But she is a Shakespearean actress, a professional modern actress. And she is a lady in control of her own fate. And she's probably in control of mine, too. Perhaps yours as well. She's quite used to being decisive and commanding. And so I try to impart to her walking and to her moving and to her static appearance a sense of dramatic uh, command. You really must pay attention to her while she's on stage. That's her whole desire and intent. Now, I'm using the specials that I talked about a little earlier. I can bring both of her hands to parts of her head, or one while the other is remaining at liberty out to the side. I think I'll just give her an exit now. I'd ask you to look at the, at the character actor. This gentleman is a very mellow fellow. He's probably 75 years old or thereabouts and has been in show business all of his life. He may have worked as a rouseabout in a circus. He may have sold candy or taken tickets. I suspect he's been a prop man at a New York Broadway theater for a long time, but he's a consummate actor. He's a very capable craftsman. I suppose he might play in a number of Shakespeare roles. Lear, perhaps, or uh, maybe he could play Falstaff, a number of other citizen types. I have enlarged his hands uh, to a somewhat larger scale than the rest of his figure in order to give you a chance to see his character through the shape and the texture of his hands. That's a deliberate distortion from the human proportion. All of these characters I'm showing you right now are the, the, the heads and the costumes. The heads were made by my mother, Margot Rose, and she made most of the costumes as well, although I made, uh, what, I, I made two of them and she made the other two of these Shakespeare characters. I'm going to show you his special string. There he is. He has only one special that I've given him. Let me show you the third of these Shakespeare characters. This is the leading man. These controls are all of a type. They all have the same basic features I showed you earlier. Now this young fellow is extremely handsome and very much aware of the fact I've given his hands a measure of, of sculptural interest, which signifies his dramatic talent, perhaps, but also his interest in things dramatic and delicate. He has two specials, and I'll pluck them one at a time for you. Here's one. You can see that that might lend itself to a romantic Shakespearean gesture. Here's the other. Oh, they're two together now. I've got them both. That'll do, won't it? See if I can get one without the other. There we go. There he is. He's been struck with inspiration. Or perhaps a headache. There. Those gestures and movements are fairly romantic yeah, and uh, are intended to be so. Elizabethan, if you will. The ultimate Elizabethan, of course, is Shakespeare himself. 
<clears throat> and I'm going to show you an engraving, the Droshout engraving, on which his character was based. I hope that image is satisfactory so that you can see, make a comparison in the camera eye. There he is. Again, this head is one that was designed and built by my mother, Margot Rose. I did the costume, which really was my major contribution to this little effort. This marionette, I think, can serve as a warning to me and perhaps to any other puppeteer. I'm going to raise him up near where I can see him a little better myself. I believe that the value of this marionette is largely in simple recognition. This is William Shakespeare, and that he doesn't have to dance in order to be an entertaining marionette. He does have to appear to be very closely a, a resemblance to what people remember of any images they may have seen of William Shakespeare. Unfortunately, his costume, which is fairly elaborate, constricts his movement, particularly in his legs. Too bad, but that's just the way it is. I'm going to show you one more marionette before we get to the closing part of this little program. This is a marionette, the head of which was carved by my grandfather, Frank B. Rose, I believe sometime around 1930. My grandfather was a character very much appreciated by all of us in the family, and he uh, when he attended our large family reunions at table, he would request my father, Rufus, to bring out the farmer, Marionette, and give him a little lecture and a little interview at the table next to the turkey bones and the leftover cranberry salad. And so this character, or one very much like him, would come out. My father, of course, brought him out from the puppet trunk and would bring him up to my grandfather where he would address him in insulting and intimate tones and my grandfather and this character, this Yankee farmer, would discuss the uh, ups and downs of raising a very large family. Notice in the characterizing that I've done here in this costume, I've given him what I suppose to be a rough uh, equivalent to a farmer's outfit. He's dressed up to make an appearance in town on Saturday or at a, or at a family gathering. He's wearing a, a, a small plaid and a little red hanky sticking out of his jeans. Notice also that in the painting of this character, uh, his lower face is dark. It has been uh, burned by the sun, whereas his upper, upper parts of his head have, have remained untanned. He wears a straw hat when he's out at work, but now he's come to meeting or come to dinner. Well, Frankie, how be you? I see you've got three more children this year than you had last year. Fecundity has its blessings, ain't it? Well, so much for that. I see you've had it all. You haven't left a thing. That's very good. Margot makes a good meal, doesn't she? Well, well, Rufus is blessed with a good woman. That's more or less the character that he would portray. <laughs> Again, I, I reiterate, this controller is identical to the one that I showed you earlier. The leg, the hand control, the three-point control. I have added, for most of my characters, a fourth point on the hand control. Notice this, a close-up on my hand will show you this. There's a string at the rear of the, of the hand control, which controls the marionette's elbow. The one just about an inch in front of it controls his wrist. And then the pinky and thumb are the remaining two front corners of the control. Well, he's going to go back into the bag. And I think I'm going to close out this little exercise by giving you a little more of Pepito, my lead marionette. I'm going to describe him uh, and the process that I went through when I, as I designed him. This marionette was conceived as an exercise in a class devoted to the design and construction of marionettes. And at the very beginning, I had, first of all, I, I, uh, I trusted the feeling I had about uh, my desire to create a character who was rather tender, rather open, rather strong in terms of his openness and his friendliness, 
and totally innocent, willing to meet anyone on his own terms. And so I created Pepito in my mind's eye as about a 14, perhaps 15-year-old boy traveling around in 15th century Italy, let's say, uh, with a troop of entertainers. I wanted him to have the ability to walk up to a, an individual and look at them innocently, and I thought with great focus. So I did two things. I gave him a rather pointed nose so that he could be pointing right at you with his nose, and I crossed his eyes just a little bit so that as he looked at you, his eyes really did seem to focus and close in on you. Now the rough is just a uh, traditional rough for, for uh, a performer of that period. And I chose not to put him in red, white, and blue, green, and yellow, fancy, uh, bright colors, but rather to put him in a subdued, deep, dark brown, so that there'd be a, a linear resemblance to the period, but that his, his costume would not be uh, garish or bright or loud. I wanted him to make his appeal with soft innocence rather than with, with uh, a loud clash and bang. I'm going to put him down on the floor and uh, just let him look around the room a little bit. Okay. He's going to go back to my little control knob here and turn on a little Mozart. <laughs> 